just on 6 a.m. in the morning. Welcome to the PTGA Speaker Series. Uh, and this week we're going all the way around the world, uh, well, certainly from where I am, not from where probably a lot of you are because New Zealanders and Australians are fast asleep, Australians. Um, and uh, we're going to uh, visit Svalbard this week. Program of PTGA. We've uh, this is about information. Uh, we're pretty. Everyone's pretty aware, I think, of the sort of slowdown certainly in our industry uh, and the impacts of COVID around the world. Svalbard being one of those places that uh, a lot of PTGA members work, whether they're uh, land-based guides solely or whether they're ship-based guides who go there, go to Svalbard for either. Um, just a short season on uh, any size vessel uh, or some people who are on a vessel but work for a very long time uh, during the season up there. And we thought, um, given the fact that there's all sorts of rumour, uh, uh, no one can go there from the, the other part of parts of the world, but plenty of rumour about Svalbard Guide standards being introduced by the Norwegian government, um, uh, guides, all sorts of issues for guides on the ground rather than speculate on how it might be from a PTGA point of view, we thought we should talk to some people on the ground. Um, and so I, we've been in touch and we have a couple of people who were willing to chat and we have uh, Franka Leiterer, who is uh, the administrator, uh, will fill us in shortly, of the Svalbard Guides Association, and Kale Schoning, who's uh, uh, an experienced guide. Both of these folks are senior polar guides with the PTGA. And welcome to Guides Inside. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, so let's let's kick off. And I, I want to disclose to uh, folks who are watching live and or later on, by and large, the PTGA tries to avoid um, sort of uh, political comment and diving deeply into other people's business where we don't necessarily have um, much of a game. It's not to say that we're going to go nuts with this session, but um, uh, the idea was to try and get behind uh, some opinions and perceptions of the guiding world from uh, a Longyearbyen or Svalbard view. I also want to protect our panelists and the fact that they've both volunteered to do this um, it doesn't mean that they are the world experts and know everything about this, but we wanted to speak to some people on the ground and they agreed to do it. So please uh, take it easy on these folks in the cafes in uh, Longyearbyen uh, after, after the show if you disagree with anything they said. The idea is that this is a full and frank discussion and it's, it's the best we as other guides from around the world can do to try and figure out what it's like uh, in Svalbard and what the mindset is, um, you know, at, at this particular time with a limited season and a whole lot of rumours on the horizon. So let's kick it off. Um, Frank, are you administer or, or feel free to correct me with the right term, but you run the Svalbard Guide Association. Can you tell us a little bit about that, how it came about and what its goals are? Well, um, I'm sort of part of the board of the Svalbard Guide Association. We are a very small board um, and the Svalbard Guide Association was founded in 2018. So we're not super old. Um, it started basically as a come together between guides to see if we can maybe start working on the conditions for guides in Longyearbyen, especially regarding um, the contracts, regarding uh, housing conditions and some other issues. And that all sort of developed them into the Swabite Guide Association. And we have kind of formed a bit more what we are and what we are not are. So it's super important for us that we are not a union. So we are simply, <laughs> yes, it is like, uh, it's very hard to get that into people uh, people's mind, but we are not a union. So we, we do not take any fights with companies regarding contracts. Um, we only want to act as an intermediate between the guides and companies, but also Sissemann, which is the governor here on Svalbard. Um, maybe the, the companies, uh, especially Visit Svalbard, which is representing the companies uh, and so on. So we kind of want to help with the information flow between the guides and everyone else that has in some way a connection to the guides. So that has um, taken some time because a lot of the companies were 
were rather suspicious of us, but now we're getting to the point where they understand that we want to work on the same side. We, we just want to improve um, quality of guiding, the, the standards of guiding and so on, on in Svalbard especially. So it's been a bit of a longer process. Nice one. And uh, so I'll, I'll read the SGA is not a union. And I'll do it on behalf of the PTGA because our history follows uh, or started a little earlier than yours, but was the same line. The PTGA is not a union. So we've had our community um, notices put up. So that's good to go. So um, so let me let me get this right. You don't you don't monetize this. So there's not a, is there a membership fee? And and why aren't you a union? <laughs> well, uh, we are not a union simply because we don't have the the power, like the staff power behind it. We have no clue about working rights, uh, the legal matters. There are unions in Norway that have a lot of experience with this, and they are on on the case. They are trying to work out a good uh, solution for the guides, but we don't have the knowledge of it. So that's where we kind of are the information intermediate. So we bring the information, what the union needs and what they can work for. And then we kind of uh, tell them what the companies could agree to. So it's a little bit that we go in between. Um, right. What was the other question? Uh, oh, so how do you how do you fund all this? How do you oh. do people have to pay to be part of it? Uh, no, <laughs> sadly not. Wow. So this is all absolutely volunteer based and that's also the big challenge. So at the moment, there's not too many um, active members in the board because it, if it, it is unpaid, it is a volunteer based uh, thing to do. And uh, we decided not to ask for any um, membership fee because we've seen that the guides struggle already enough, especially with COVID. And there wasn't any, when we asked, there wasn't the right response that people would pay for a membership. Because also we can't really, we don't offer a product at the moment. So it's a bit hard to sell something that we don't have anything. So it is purely volunteer based to communicate in between the officials and the guides to get a better information flow. So if but there's have, someone out there that wants to uh, join us, that would be awesome. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, but you have quite a lot of members, is that right? From what I understand. Yeah, we have more than 400 members now. So we are right. quite big. But um, again, it's um, not so many active guides in Longyearbyen at the moment due to COVID. So it all has slowed down quite a lot. Yeah. And um, yeah, I understand what you're saying. Um, certainly from starting a new thing from where there was nothing before and the uh the uh how uncomfortable change management is uh in in this industry and for people to take on a new initiative um i understand and understand fully what what that's about and even you know from what i know of the history of uh industry associations like aeco and iato in the south you know, if you hear from people in the old days when the idea was planned and put forward to people, then of course there's always some people who are who are uncomfortable with this new discordant idea. Um, but you know, hey, that's life and change management, and and it's a good thing. So, um, so what is going on there, Kelly? What's what guiding options are available in Longyearbyen at the moment? What's happening? It seems like the people I talk to, everyone says, "Oh, I can't talk. I'm super busy." <laughs> Yeah, no, that's uh, true for some of us. Uh, so there are tourists coming uh, from Norway, obviously. So to get to Svalbard from outside of Norway, uh, you need to be in quarantine if you are able to come at all. So it's uh, only Norwegians coming. Um, so some of the companies have a lot to do and uh, some companies have nothing to do. Uh, so uh, yeah. It could be worse. Some of us, some are lucky and uh, some have uh, chosen to go other places to work or to look for work some, some other places. So it's um, uh, it, it's sort of, yeah, it, it could be worse, but it's it's surely not as good as uh, it, it should be, uh, as we, we wished it was, for sure. Right. But it's but there's skiing and dog sledding and skidoos and all the normal stuff, or is it a limited... Uh, array. Yeah, so 
we have had the winter season finishing now, uh, mid-May or yeah, a week ago or so. And yeah, that we, we should say this was the main season this year, the high season, uh, since we don't get uh, much uh, expedition cruising or or other cruising coming this uh, summer. Uh, so we've had uh, snowville uh, tourism, dog sledding tourism, ski ski trips, and and all kinds of um, long Airbnb based tourism where people come here to eat good food and and enjoy the the high Arctic uh, civilized world as well. Yeah, people, many Norwegians have come here because they haven't been able to go anywhere else. So we have we have been very happy for those coming. Uh, and I think they have maybe maybe some of them have felt a bit uh, bad because they are not supposed to travel, and uh, we right. have tried to make them understand that uh, they are very welcome here. <laughs> they don't need to hide. Right. Well, let's let's take a deep dive. Um, it's been a lot of uh, there's been a lot of social media um, sort of flare ups. I would call it. I guess someone makes a comment about something on. Uh, one of the social media platforms about the guide standards in Svalbard. Um, so my questions, uh, keen, things I'm keen to explore with you. I want keen to know what the feeling on the ground from a, a Svalbard, or, or for those of you or anyone you know Norwegian, um, what the feeling is there, uh, what their understanding of the issues are, and um, and what's the solution to this whole thing. There's a lot to do there. We can spend some time on this. Yeah, well, Spell, spell by uh, guide standards. Go. <laughs> well, first of all, um, I have a, a lot of connection to this uh, town and and to Svalbard and so on. But uh, I'm not uh, Norwegian. I'm Swedish. So if I say uh, bad things about uh, Norway and Norwegians, uh, uh, I'm already excused because I'm I'm Swedish. Uh, I, have, but, I have a Norwegian, my yeah. best Norwegian jersey on. Uh, but um, I, I think th this about certification here in uh, in Svalbard has the, the talk about it has been going on for yeah twenty years at least. It's been brought up uh, every now and then, uh, and it's always ended up with uh, we don't need any certification, just like the. Certified uh, mountain guides in Norway, uh, the, they uh, you don't need to be any kind of certified guides to have the job of a mountain guide in Norway, as opposed to other countries like the Alp countries and Italy and so on. Uh, really? So it's a kind of a, I did not know. yeah. So it's a kind of a tradition and culture in Norway that we we don't. We don't want to force people to go with the guide because we want to go be able to go by ourselves. Uh, but also, we here today, uh, just like earlier, we don't, or maybe even more than earlier, don't really see the need for mandatory certifications here uh, for the reason that we we feel that we are pretty well prepared already. Uh, we, there are, of course, issues, and the tourism is growing, and we need to uh, take that into account. But uh, we have a quite well developed tourism here, uh, based in Longyearbyen. Uh, so we we don't, yeah, we don't uh, immediately see huge is issues that has to be taken care of by making certifications mandatory. Uh, I would. Do you totally disagree, Franca? Yeah. Not totally disagree. So um, I'm German. <laughs> so just to uh, get that right. Um, and there's another point why, um, like Kalle pointed out, something quite important, and that is that, of course, with within the Norwegian tradition, a lot of people go out in nature and they have a lot of experience themselves. Um, so Svalbard has been, or Longyearbyen, has been Norwegian since many, many years. And it's been a mining town. So it has a completely different history. And then slowly tourism started uh, to happen. So then there was usually a few people who were really good in outdoors, taking out uh, guests or 
tourists. Um, so that has slowly developed and tourism has kind of slowly become bigger and bigger. For me, and I'm uh, like, we wanted to point out that we are not together or something. Like we, we do have different uh, points of view. Uh, we just sit here because Telenor has decided to um, destroy Carla's <laughs> internet. <laughs> um, no, but uh, so I, for me, as the Swabat Guide Association, for our like our biggest goal is to uh, make sure that the guide um, occupation becomes a profession. And the only way to become a profession is through certification. There's no profession in the world where you don't need to be certified. There can be a plumber, that can be an electrician, that can be a doctor. You need to do some sort of certification. And I think that is super important that that we as guides, our occupation, if we want to be taken seriously, we need to grow up <laughs> to become, uh, to be able to play with the adults. We need to be a profession. Like we need to be accepted as a profession. And the only way to do that is we think through certification. Um, I do understand that there's people who have 20 years of experience and I'm 100% sure they are great guides. But I could also say I have 20 years of experience and no way of proving it. So I need to, there needs to be a way to validate my experience into a into some sort of certification and it's also really important to make differences here between guides that may, mainly only work with snowballs but then also guides that only work with kayaking or maybe lecturers so i think there's a it's a big challenge to come up with a standard guide certification because of so many different areas we work in and so many different uh, specializations basically Right. Um, okay. Wow. That was good, Franco. Uh, you know, if you need votes for president for some small country, then um, then then I, I'm in. Uh, <laughs> Kelly, I want to go back to you. Um, uh, interesting comment that you say that uh, that guides are good in Longyearbyen, so we don't need anything. You've you've read? Have you read Lord of the Flies by any means? You understand that <laughs> social. What social I, entity I means? If a, group, if a group of people think they have all the answers and close themselves out, what happens with that? Uh, well, uh, so this was my answer to uh, what is the general uh, uh, view on this in town. Uh, it was not my view, and I 100% uh, agree on Franca. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait a get out. Okay, no, well, let's. Well, that's yes. good. But so, uh, I would. Uh, I would say. Uh, Having yeah, having taken part in tourism in also other fields than longyearbyen based tourism, yeah, uh, I I would say there are other other tourism industries in this world that are less prepared than than longyearbyen. It is a lot of um, well working routines and and guides here, but. Uh, there is yeah, that is not an argument to uh, develop it further. Right. Yes, and 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 I'm not. I don't want to offer this as as an answer to to everything. But um, it's it's people often ask me why the PTGA even came into an exist into existence, and I cite send people off to look up anything from the New Zealand Outdoor Education System, New Zealand Mountain Guiding, even international IFMGA Mountain Guiding. Uh, any pretty much any heli ski or rafting operation that you find anywhere in the world, all of those uh, were started by a group of guides who suddenly decided, you know, part of it, not all of them, um, but some people decided, as to paraphrase Franca, that we need to make this a profession and to be accountable to that whole thing. And so they, they start from grassroots an association of, you know, insert your own industry guides here, rafting, heli ski, mountain guides, uh, beach walking guides, whatever it is. And then, and then first of all, that starts. And then at some stage they think, oh, okay, this is great. We have a forum to talk to people. Now we, the next step is we need to, we need to agree on at least some minimum standards of competency to be part of that. And that, um, that, my friends, is, uh, is an absolutely standard way 
that that these things evolve around the world in in all sorts of cultures. Um, so, Franco, back to you. You have SGA has over four hundred odd members. Um, PTGA shares uh, probably a small number or some number of those people who have decided to use our system, which um, which which we you know we do what the PTGA does, um, but part of yours. But there's an awful lot of people guided that either think the PTGA is a total washout and just don't want to be part of it. How how can we how can we increase and help your message um, and and also uh, increase the acceptance of a simply a minimum competency testing scheme, which is which is what the PTGA is. Uh, well, first of all, of course, talks like this are, I think, the best uh, way to raise awareness um, and to explain over and over again what you're doing and what you're not. <laughs> That's very important. <laughs> um, and I think uh, probably some people have gotten it wrong at the beginning and then they just kind of stick to it. And it takes some time to kind of take down those uh, walls that they have built up. And then at one point you maybe get uh, through to them. And for example, I um, like uh, it would help a lot to get assessors in Longyearbyen so people can become certified through PTGA if they wish so. So that would be a really, really good um, advantage. So guides here, because I've talked to many guides in town, and because of that um, involvement of the government kind of pushing towards a mandatory certification, a lot of the guides go like, oh, maybe I should actually go to PTGA and get myself um, you know, um, assess to, to, to see what I can work on and where I can get better and what I maybe or am I already really good in. So they want to be assessed, but if there's no assessors here, then it's of course difficult, especially now with COVID. So um, yes. traveling is uh, very restricted. Um, so I think that is a good thing. Also maybe getting a bit um, into like becoming more visible through uh, we usually yearly have a guide conference here on Svalbard um, to kind of just co like repeat that you're there, um, what you want to do and um, like invite uh, guides to maybe for some training. There is a few possibilities, but it is, of course, um, it's not going to happen overnight. That's my experience here in Longyearbyen. Everything takes time. Nice one. Um, key, one thing you did say there, um, Franca, that I want to just um, uh, really make sure that people understand. Uh, you said that uh, having more assessors in Longyearbyen so that people can choose, and choose will always be a key issue. I, re I recall from looking through your survey, the, the SGA survey that, that went out pre the Norwegian government meeting, uh, there's a, a couple of comments in there about PTGA looking to create a monopoly and make it mandatory. Um, I do want to stand on that one pretty hard and say that PTGA does not want a monopoly and we are not advocating mandatory. Um, so let's just be really clear on that one. Kelly, um, you're, you work there, but you're uh, non-Norwegian. What, what's the feeling on the ground between Nor your Norwegian peers and colleagues uh, is is there a Norway and others feel, or is it is that okay? Uh, well, it this town and the guiding has developed a bit more in, international uh, since I moved up, and um, that's uh, yeah, it's neither good or bad. Like uh, first of all, the the Norwegians have developed. Uh, a lot of good things up here, and they are natural, uh, naturally really suitable for for working as guides up here. Uh, so, uh, but uh, now, yeah, now there are more international guides, and maybe that has also to do with the guide uh, guide education, Arctic Nature Guide study. That yeah, we have both done this one. Uh, but uh, within the tourism industry. Uh, among us, there is nothing uh, between, yeah, like nothing Norwegians versus foreigners. We are all working together and it's 
totally natural for us to speak the appropriate language, English or or uh, or Norwegian Swedish. Right. Uh, yes. We cannot speak. Uh, so so there there is no 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 big deal about that. I would say. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Yeah. Partly among the among the guides and among yeah. the the companies, I, yeah. I, I'm talking about. Like among the guides, for sure, I think there is no big difference. But uh, they are companies that at now only hire guides who speak Norwegian, so that is a difference. Um, uh, and of course, there is a big change, kind of like it's it's very geopolitical. Like it's 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 a lot of geopolitics behind it, I guess. Uh, nobody really knows what the plan is, but of course, uh, the Norwegian government has decided to um, close down all the mining on Svalbard, and that kind of leaves them with a big problem because they removed the only reason to be here, or they have removed it. They will remove in the next few years, so they need to replace it with something. And they are focusing on tourism, but it looks like they are pushing very hard to focus on Norwegian companies providing for their tourism. And we've seen that there is a big challenge for international uh, companies, which are maybe Norwegian. So they 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 act uh, on Svalbard since many years, since 10 years. They are here. They are paying Norwegian tax. They are a Norwegian company, but they focus on international guests, for example, German, Italian, whatever. So they have a focus um for their clients which brings a lot of clients to Svalbard but they for example were refused to get any help from the Norwegian government during Covid now with the explanation that they are not Norwegian the owners are not Norwegian so the, it's a Norwegian company registered in Norway but the ownership is not Norwegian and therefore they're not getting any help and that's of course super tricky when you look into the Svalbard treaty so I I don't know what's going on there I have I will never step in it <laughs> but wow. it is interesting to see but the only ones who can give you an answer to this is the Norwegian government right. and they have not said anything um black on white sort of like they there's a lot of hints like they they closed the bank here in Longyearbyen which is a major issue for international people not so much for Norwegians because they usually already have a bank account from coming from Norway. But when you come here, as you don't have to live in Norway before you come to Svalbard, uh, it, it leaves you without the bank account. So how are you supposed to work if you don't have a Norwegian bank account to receive payment in? Um, it is a big struggle also with like kind of a D, like what is that, an identification number? that you need to work here on Svalbard. They also made that again harder because to get that, you need a bank account. <laughs> so there are some people really, really struggling to um, just set up the basics to work and live on Svalbard. Right. Yeah, wow. and, and uh, that's definitely true. I totally agree. And, and um, it, it's uh, very interesting to see, or I would say amusing to see, unless you're very targeted by this if uh, by these uh, problems issues uh, and and it's amusing also since um, uh, we norway if you go to oslo there is not a single uh, norwegian working in in the stores or in mcdonald's or so on uh, it's foreigners and mostly swedish uh, and if if they would be if they would be forbidden to work in Oslo, it, it wouldn't just happen that the Norwegians would take over those positions. Uh, so it, it is similar here that it's not so simple to just, uh, if, if this is the, the aim uh, which we are discussing, uh, if that is the case, then Norwegians won't just come up here and, and take over the positions of the foreign guides in in a day. That will that will not happen. And housekeeping yeah. and waitressing mm -hmm. and like kind of all the jobs that are service minded are mainly taken care of by international workers. So there is a reason for that. It's uh, not comparable salary compared to higher jobs. Let's say in. 
uh, like working uh, in the mines or working for um, Susan or something like those ones are much better paid. So a Norwegian rarely comes to Svalbard to work here because they can earn so much money working as a guide. Uh, you're probably better off on the mainland. So it is a big challenge. So if the governor or if the government in Oslo decides to make this more Norwegian, they haven't thought this completely through because Longyearbyen is such an international community now that by kind of cutting away all those, um, like trying to make it more Norwegian by forcing it to be Norwegian, it just doesn't work. They, they haven't completely understood the community here in Longyearbyen. They're also trying to make it, I think, harder for school, like for the kids going to school now, for disabled children, it's a nightmare. So there's also for Norwegian families, a big challenge that they can't live here anymore. So they're trying to make it for some reason harder, more difficult. Wow. Jeepers, I'm not sure what to say about that other than I can only repeat again that uh, Kelly and Frank have, have agreed to join us and uh, if, if you're, if anyone's the political police on this whole thing, please don't go knocking at their door. Um, they actually, that's not their real names, we're using pseudonyms. <laughs> um, let's just take a step away from that. Um, got some questions coming in from uh, the, the wider world. Uh, you may not know about this because I know it's relatively new, but what's your read at the moment on this um, new gun rule, firearm rule that uh, hit social media the other day? Well, it's it's a national uh, national law. It's nothing Svalbard specific. Uh, it might be designed to target Svalbard, maybe, but uh, it it's nothing that is only concerning Svalbard. It's concerning the whole Norway. But it That's will all have, I know. Yeah, but it will, like I ask my uh, partner, he's Norwegian, <laughs> so he understands the law a bit better than me. And I ask him and he read a little bit through those new regulations and it is making it like the, the result of it is that it will be harder to rent weapons um, if you don't have a hunting license and you own a weapon already. So for me, example, for example, I came to Svalbard, I had no hunting license, um, never handled a weapon before. So I did this uh, safety course with Eunice and then I was able to use my police certificate, I think. And with that, I was able to buy a weapon and also to rent weapons. That's gonna be harder now. So you either need to do a safety course in your own country. Um, you need to prove in some way that you have some sort of weapon training um, or you have to do a course here to then be able to carry a certain weapon. Um, as far as we all have understood as well, for example, I own a rifle, so I might not be able to, to rent a shotgun because it's a different kind of weapon. So it's also uh, weapon specific, what ki right, kind of right. weapon it is. So it, may, might be, it might become very much harder for those weapon masters uh, on ships. Um, but the governor, as far as I've seen, Susuman has already put out an online form that you can use to apply, uh, and they can probably help with this a lot. I think it is extra paperwork, mainly extra paperwork and maybe training that you need to get prior um, before you go on board. So it won't be possible, I think, to get a training by someone on the ship. Like I won't be like, if Kalle has no idea, I won't be able to show him how to use a weapon and then give him my weapon. I think they try to avoid this. Right, okay. Um, is that having any any bigger implications around or is, is this just an, you know another kind of blip in the radar in Svalbard and you have bigger issues to worry about? Um, for us personally, we've been like, I think people like guides working on Swabart, we are so used to handling weapons that it's probably no problem at all to, with new regulations, it might be some paperwork for some who don't have a hunting license, uh, but most of us own a weapon anyway. Um, I think it's, it's um, probably for the cruise ships more difficult than also for seasonal guides coming in maybe. I don't think it's a main concern. It can also uh, vary a lot how it is implemented in some ways. Um, yeah, how much it'll 
actually have an effect on the tourism up here and the companies based here. We don't know. Yeah. I think right. it's aiming for private mm -hmm. people going to the sports shop and renting weapons. Right. That right. will be harder. Yeah. Okay. Um, I want to take another dive, change direction a little bit here now, just because, so, you know, I've worked many, many seasons uh, in Svalbard, uh, primarily or solely based on, on vessels. Uh, I've felt represented guide profession um, to the best of my ability when I've been doing that. I've, I've worked with uh, Norwegian and Svalbard based guides and felt like they were peers and, and part of the family. But, you know, I, I noticed, Franca, on the survey, guide survey that you did pre the Norwegian meeting, um, you had a you had an incredible response rate to that. But uh, but and still the 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 split of ship based guides versus land based guides seemed to be 50 50 on that. What 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 what's the feeling of on the ground in Svalbard of, you know, us ship weirdos or ship nerds or things? Are we are we hopeless? compared to on the ground guides who ski and skidoo and you know carry rifles like they're a pair of underwear and um, <laughs> all of that sort of thing what's the perception fill us in okay yeah yeah i i think in general what is underestimated is how many guides are actually working cruise ship based and that's my whole point because when i'm i'm res representing the Swalbard guide association and that is including land-based guides and ship guides. So we try to represent all of you, all of us, whoever works on Swabbard, if seasonal or yearly, I don't really care, but all of them. And we've seen in our talks to the governor and to everyone else, to the government actually, that they have no idea how many guides work throughout the year on Swabbard, either on ships or land-based. And I think even locals underestimate how many guides work on ships. And that was really interesting to see in this kind of survey. And I think that's also where a few ships might not be part of IECO and they do weird stuff. And then they are, you know, post a YouTube video and then everyone goes like, oh, the cruise ships and they do all this bad stuff. <sighs> like land-based or ship-based, you always have maybe one or two cow who might break some regulations or they do things not as they uh, maybe should do. Um, so I don't think necessarily there is a difference, but I do think that in Longyearbyen itself, locals don't think always very highly of cruise ships. Is, um, is that just, I is that because I do know that there are some people that love uh, expedition cruising and they are really behind it and they, they understand the concept. A lot of people are also joining the ships around Svalbard yeah. because they, yeah, many yeah. people live here. We, we can call ourselves a bit tourists. Yeah. Some people live here for yeah. just two, three years and they are sort of tourists as well. So, of course, they join these ships. Yeah. But yeah. if you have someone that maybe has lived here for 30 years and never went on a cruise, they might be super suspicious of it and very negative. It's just, it's like they don't know what it is, so they are against it. Yes, it must be quite a double-edged sword for some people because, uh, you know, you spend a long time, uh, you're younger, a little more robust, and you're out there in the freezing cold wrangling skidoos and dogs and skis and pulling people out of the ice and all of that kind of stuff. But sooner or later, uh, you get a little bit older and think, oh, maybe I'll, I can carry on guiding here. But, um, you know, but this <laughs> working on a boat looks pretty plush, really, you know, pop yeah, on well, outside for a couple of hours. Well, it, it, if you check on the, the books, the guidebooks about Svalbard, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but the the people, the, the ones who have written those books, they are not really locals or like uh, some of them are half locals. Uh, and it's a lot of knowledge among expedition cruise guides. Uh, a lot of knowledge that locals don't have, that uh, maybe they should have or maybe they don't need to. Uh, but uh, for expedition cruise guides, uh, Svalbard is Svalbard, and for locals, um, Longyearbyen is Svalbard sometimes. Right. Is, <laughs> is there, you know, Franke, your, your uh, 
you're you seem to me to be a connector what what can we do is there anything we can do to to you know to to uh improve this real or perceived rift or difference between these you know these groups uh it's again having talks like this inviting as many people as possible maybe when covid is uh, over when traveling is a bit easier to to come up have um like a, a meeting face to face invite invite um anyone who wants to not just the guides but whoever wants to look at it um free pizza is always a good thing <laughs> but it works in long been really good <laughs> but yeah kind of just Excellent. to show um that you want to um share information and that you want to share knowledge so what we started to do for example in the company i work for we offer um, basically free trips um, for locals to join us and longer trips maybe to the east coast which is a full day trip it involves glacier travel sea ice travel and we actually teach the locals what we look for what are the safety issues how to prepare for this what to bring and we had gotten a huge positive response from that. They really loved it. So suddenly they see, wow, that's what the guides do. And they start to understand what this profession actually means. Nice. I've got a question here from Anya regarding any courses in Longyearbyen. Is, it, is there actually someone already offering these? And while well, they're suggesting maybe there's a business idea here. Uh, what kind of yeah so guide courses, guide courses there is uh, the arctic nature guide course here right uh, well, what about what you know i this is a question from someone that question was from someone else but i can throw my own in there what's the capacity in long you to actually teach uh guy not just guide skills but even if it went to a norwegian certification what's the capacity for long you to, to to put these people through considering uh hundreds of people would come from different companies to work on ships if, assuming ships were allowed to continue their operations but needed to have certified only norwegian standard guides is it possible uh, not now and uh, this would be amazing if someone took uh, initiative to this maybe uh, franca <laughs> maybe graham well you can't but we can't get a bank account yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, we, we uh, they could there is potential for building up such a capacity, but at the moment uh, there's no we cannot uh, educate all the potentially mandatory Svalbard guides up here. That's not possible. Right. So, so have, good. I'm glad that's on. Re I'm, sorry, Franka, go ahead. Sorry. We we have figured out there is about four between four hundred and six hundred to seven hundred guides. Our ECO even said a thousand guides that would need to be certified. And that's a number, I mean, long you've been to, to give you kind of an idea, we have about 2,100 people living here. So we're a very small community. <laughs> so we can't, like we, we cannot ever have an education forced up on us or a certification where we suddenly need to certify a thousand guides. That doesn't work. We don't have the accommodation. We don't have um, companies that could, or businesses that could provide such education. We of course have UNIS and they have a sa safety center. They can do some of the courses, but they have an, a safety center. So that means they do um, weapon training, um, avalanche training, maybe glacier training. So safety related courses, but guiding is not just safety. Guiding is so much more. You have so much soft skills that need to be focused on. So having courses kind of, offering what a guide wants to be trained in or for example kai like color is uh, kayak instructor so you know maybe a guide wants to become a kayak in like instructor or something like this like there's so many possibilities and there's a few companies offering courses like glacier courses i think we have a few avalanche courses um but it's not really one school there's no yeah Guide right. Education School. And just to go back on what you said earlier, um, right at the start, Franca, let's just say that you you wanted to do this. It, is it possible, given the fact that there seems to be the squeeze on some, if something's non-Norwegian as a business idea? So you wanted to start, you know, Franca's Guiding School, 
but you can't get a bank account, you can't get government assistance, and you're stuck, you know, where you can't just drive to, uh, you know, a, a large box store and buy all the stuff you need to set up. Is it possible? Well, I would look for a Norwegian partner. Nah, <laughs> to you already make have that. No, uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> that is very true. But I meant a business partner. Um, no, it is, I would say, to start up something as an international at this point is maybe not the wisest choice to do. It might be very difficult. I don't know. I feel a lot of resistance towards international driven companies. So I would team up with Norwegians to make it possible. I think it, it's smarter. It's smarter. Right. You could maybe even apply for some funding. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, I want to move on to um, just to looking at the chief message. Um, and, you know, this is a spoiler alert that PTGA and, and SGA um, that we share. Uh, and recently, Franca, at the Norwegian government meeting that you and I attended, um, can you give us a, a quick synopsis of your of the main uh, themes that you issued to the Norwegian government there and said that it was really important that these things, uh, you know, are allowed to happen? Um, yeah, so just quickly, there was this um, meeting that the Norwegian government invited to to give feedback regarding this planned um, mandatory certification for guides on Svalbard. And um, we try to focus, um, or we always have been focusing on that certification for guides and companies is one of our biggest goals for the association. And then of course, it is super important for us that the institution who will implement or who will make those standards needs to be an institution that has years of experience. It can't be, for example, Susuman. They don't simply have the expertise to develop a certification for guides. So it needs to be someone that has done that before. They have experience with it. If that is ANG or like, so ANG is the Arctic Nature Guide Study that Kalle mentioned before that takes a year. It's only about 10 international students that are accepted every year. So it's very few international students. Um, and then we have the SGO, that's the Svalbard Guide Oblering, that is offered twice a year. Um, so there are institutions on Svalbard who's done that before. But then again, this is a very international task to do because there are so many international guides. So we would love to see to have someone um, maybe cooperating or get, finding a good co collaboration in between um, the International Mountain Guide Association could be part of this, the PTGA could be part of it, because the PTGA already has a perfect module system in place. So if the government is smart, then they look at those kind of programs or associations and, and, and work together with them. Like, I think this needs to be a a joint um yeah task something yeah. if you so, want to so, so that was important for us so that is kind of what we pointed out that the institution is uh, super important um and it can't be just made up by the government either and um, the content of course is important uh it needs to be recognized and you need to be able to recognize also education that you had from before or experience that you had from before and it needs to be affordable um, yeah, basically, so there were, I shared also our um, input uh, on the Swabart Guide Association Facebook site, so you can read it up. Thanks for that, Franca. Yeah, those, so those keen themes, the key themes of allowing, you know, standards are okay and to have some Norwegian standards, uh, we, we all agreed and as did most of the other stakeholders at this meeting. Um, but the, the really important issue, I think, from uh, certainly from PTGA's perspective, and I know that you um, share these same ideas, Franca, um, and Calais by virtue of being a PTGA member, um, that, you know, that equivalencies have to be allowed um, and, you know, to have transportable qualifications is absolutely crucial in this in this industry because, you know, we all know that guides aren't paid a lot of money and the moment um, a sovereign nation slaps down and says you must have a Norwegian, this Norwegian thing or this Russian thing or this Canadian thing, 
then our ability to travel to do to do a trip from starting in Longyearbyen, going to Greenland, finishing in Iqaluit, um, where you need three sets of certifications is absolutely ridiculous. And so, um, uh, you know, that the voice we need to have um, to to ensure that, you know, equivalencies and transportability of whatever awards we have, whether you're an IFMGA guide, whether you're SGA, whether you're ANG qualified, that those things mean something somehow or other um, was a really important important thing um we're we're getting on for 50 minutes um, someone mentioned again about the uh the sgo modular guide course uh, i see a question here i think this is probably a little bit flippant but uh when do you become a local in long well it long been uh it's a town where people move when they are grown-ups uh, as a rule but there are, uh, of course, a lot of exceptions to that rule. Uh, but uh, people who live here today, they haven't uh, usually lived here for so many years. So uh, if you are local, that's because you are living here right now. <laughs> that's the simple question, <laughs> or simple answer. <laughs> I think there is a question of residency. I think it's like half a year, and then you become actually a resident of Swabart. I think That's so. Like there correct, is a, yeah. a little bit of um, some, yeah, bureaucracy right. behind it. And then you get an alcohol card, and then uh, you are officially a local. <laughs> I I I was hoping to get in with my jersey. Um, <laughs> we have another we have another another question here. Um, with expedition cruising, uh, they tend to have a highly international crew sailing up and down the planet every year. You know, guides who are coming there. Is is there any point in guides? Uh, joining the SGA uh, when you're not from, if you're not from Svalbard, Longyearbyen. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. of course, of course. Like, uh, like um, we are not. Um, you don't have to be based on Svalbard to become Svalbard Guide uh, Association member. Um, for us, it is important that you work sometimes on Svalbard, so you know what our um, issues are. Okay. Um, I want to just flick back to your survey again, um, Franca, and my interpretation of uh, some of the things there. What interested me was um, over 75% of your 400-odd respondents thought that uh, a guide should have uh, an education slash certification before guiding in Svalbard. So that you know that was interesting because it said to me that out of your 400 um, respondents, a large percentage of people agree on the general concept. Then in the comments, there's an awful lot of comments from I presume probably old um, old crusties and uh, and or people uh, somehow m missing out on the bigger picture, saying that with this old refrain that experience counts most. And that experience, experience must be counted. And and I agree. Don't get me wrong with that. My question to you and to all of those people is: How do you measure in a fair way someone's experience? Do you take their word from it? How is that possible? If so many people want just want to be touched on the shoulder for their legendariness and experience, how do we do that? I, I would I would sort of assume that if you have so many years of experience that you have taken part in some kind of courses and programs and kind of like development. If you haven't even done that, maybe you should. <laughs> <laughs> Kelly, there there are a lot of people who 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 have noted in SGA responses and I've had the same thing at PTGA. I've been doing this for 30 years, I've never done a course. I'm really good at my job. I should just be given this. Yeah, well, I, I think uh, it's always uh, it's always helpful with some fresh input. And uh, yeah, I don't see why people don't take any kind of development courses if they are so into this that they have stayed for so many years. Uh, so uh, it could like taking courses, certifications, and so on could be a start, or it could be 
a continuation of, of development. For myself, I started uh, freelance guiding here. And then I took this Arctic Nature Guide program because I, I thought it was uh, super fun to work with guiding. And it was natural. And I think that that can be, yeah, it it should be natural if, if you're so much into this anyway. And I also think, um, or I personally, I never stop learning. So I can learn from someone that is has just started guiding, has no experience whatsoever, but they have uh, really good questions and they have really good approaches, new approaches to things. So I think it's very dangerous to believe that as a guide, you have reached a point where you don't need to learn anymore. You can always improve, you always can become better. And I see it myself. I mean, um, of course I've done an avalanche course, but after a couple of years, how much is actually left of that avalanche course? Because of course I'm not ending up in an avalanche uh, every season because that would be really bad. So I need to continuously um, make sure that I do not forget the like the, the the knowledge and expertise I have, and I need to update that. It's like the best example is first aid. So many things are changing, and uh, you need to continuously uh, train on that because if you have a case, then it needs to come kind of out of your memory. It's nothing that you need to think about. It just should happen because you're so trained in it. But usually, don't get that training because usually, hopefully, nothing happens. So it's really important yeah. to remember that. Yeah, um, really astute replies there from both of you, which I think uh, speak to the level of professionalism as guides and uh, having some understanding of the guide profession that you both have, um, which is great. I, I do want to throw in there one of the, uh, in the early stages of the PTGA, and this is very common with any uh, professional association that starts from nothing, um, the way to get um, early adopters and people who already have loads of experience into a system like this, it's very common to have what are called grandparenting systems, which is a way to recognize uh, years of culture and experience from, um, you know, from the older group of professional guides. Um, and I do want to say I was somewhat disappointed, and I hope one day that we might see a change in this, um, when the PTGA started, we offered three recognition of current competency programs, which was, this was our grandparenting program, in which was a, a paperwork audit of a person's experience and skills, all of those things that I hear these people talking about, why isn't this measured? We, we did our best in a fairly robust system to measure that. And I will say that out of all of the guiding parts of the polar world, the least amount of response we got was from Svalbard guides who didn't seem to be interested at all in having their experience um, measured and accounted for and then put straight into uh, a measurement of have, have already achieved minimum competency. And so I just want to throw that out there. Um, people often ask us at PTGA, why don't we run this all the time? Um, it's, it's because it's, it's a massive drain on our systems and uh, administration, but it doesn't mean that it can't happen again. And people say, well, why don't you just like throw it out there? No, we won't, but I just wanna, I'm prepared to challenge the uh, listener sphere out there, whether you're listening live or later on, that if, um, if, these, if the Norwegian standards issue comes to a, more of a head and people are really feeling that their years of legendariness and experience um, are not being accounted for in any certain way, it's up to them to reach out to uh, one of the options, which is the PTGA, and request from our board, because I don't make those decisions, that perhaps we need to offer another opportunity for recognition of current competency. So um, I throw that out there to, um, to, for, for people in the, the listener sphere. At this stage, we don't have any more questions coming in. I think this has been a really good look, and I, I thank you both for your time. Um, also, to, to push the fact that we are collaborating here. Uh, Calais is joining me tomorrow on, um, uh, on a journey to being a PTGA assessor. We know that one of, as you mentioned, Franca, very early on in this, that 
one of the issues uh, there were in terms of creating capacity was uh, the fact that it's difficult for people to be assessed in PTGA qualifications in Svalbard, and we're looking to to fix that. And we look forward to having you, on, Franca, on a course uh, as soon as we can get you on there. So um, I want to thank you both for taking the risk uh, for doing this, Frank. Franca. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that I continue to hear from you tomorrow, Kelly. If you don't turn up on the assessors course, then uh, then I'll be a little bit worried. Um, Franca, I want to thank you for the incredible work that you have taken over with the SGA uh, for your um, erudite uh, delivery to the Norwegian government. Uh, what you delivered to them and how you put your points forward. I think it really hit all of the key points. Um, there for them and it was great and I'm really uh, inspired to, to know that you and I have a great relationship between the SGA and the PTGA uh, and talk a lot between us so uh, thank you so much uh, to both of you. Uh, I'll plug for next week. Next week we're having a dive into situational management, decision making theory, tools and concepts. We're going to, uh, Cam Walker is uh, a guide, senior polar guide um, and he's joining me, unfortunately, again, uh, to because this is a, a pet project or a pet interest of both of ours. And we're going to try and dive a little bit into what we know uh, of how and why polar guides make the decisions that they do and what tools we might be able to throw out there so that people can improve their decision making or their thinking about their decision making so that they can review their own performance and continue to be legendary experienced guides who don't need any qualifications. Um, so without without further ado, um, thank you both so much. Uh, enjoy the rest of your or evening in Longyearbyen. Uh, we look forward to more in, the, in the future. Yeah. Enjoy your day, Graham. <laughs> your morning. Yeah. It's time to make coffee for your wife. Ah, good point. I'm off. Thank you.